I was asked uh, to speak at the World Meeting of Families in Dublin in 2018, so I know I'm kind of dating this, uh, this video, but uh, I just finished a paper on chapters 7, 8, and 9 of Amoris Laetitia, which they asked me to talk about. And as anyone in the Catholic space knows, uh, everyone and his brother has talked about chapter 8 of Amoris Laetitia an awful lot. And I must say, I was really struck by uh, chapter 7, um, which is on moral and spiritual education. You know, there's so much in that letter that is very rich. The trouble was, A, it, it was quite long, so a lot of people didn't read it. And then there was so much attention focused on chapter 8. And I think it's good to, to look seriously at this letter. And I was very taken by chapter 7. I wanted to say three simple things about it. The Pope there talks about moral formation, formation and virtue. He talks about um, communication technology today. And he talks about um, sex education. So just something simple about each one of those. What really struck me about his views on, on virtue formation is the Pope has been clearly influenced by the virtue ethicians. Now, I'm talking about a group of philosophers and theologians the last, oh, about 25, 30 years, who put a great stress on Aristotle's idea that the way to come to moral rectitude is not primarily through rules. Now, now rules are going to play a role in it, in any kind of discipline. But primarily, it's a question, Aristotle said long ago, of habituation, of repeated action that gets certain forms of life, not just into your mind like, like rules, but it really gets it into your body. And it's through this habituation that we come to moral goodness. Um, Thomas Aquinas very much follows Aristotle here, and, and he is very much of a virtue ethician, I would say. And it allowed me to see more clearly why Pope Francis maybe sometimes in an in a, uh, exaggerated way, will be down on, on rules. Rules are good, rules are fine, but they're only part of a much bigger process of, of habituation. You know what comes to mind here is um, Stanley Hauerwas, the uh, American Methodist theologian, very much in this school. Hauerwas' dad was a bricklayer, and so as a young kid, Hauerwas learned the art of laying bricks. <laughs> he said, uh, uh, the moral life is like that. So there are rules, and I'm sure his dad at certain points said, no, no, never do that, or no, no, that's not the right way to do it, and oh, no, here, here's how. But most of learning bricklaying is a matter of laying bricks, of trial and error, of, of doing it again and again, of being corrected by masters, watching great bricklayers do their work. And that's how we tend to grow in moral virtue. Very much in line with one of my favorite thinkers, namely Servet Pinkers. The Pope says that habituation and virtue actually leads to freedom, even though it sounds the opposite. It sounds as though, oh gosh, the more you do all this, you know, rules and habituation, you're becoming less and less free. No, only on a very modern reading of freedom is that true. But classically, no, you become free now to be a great bricklayer. Just as you become a free piano player, a free player of baseball, the more you internalize through habituation the, the life of baseball, the moves of, of violin playing, etc. Right? So habituation and virtue actually leads to authentic freedom. Here's something else, also very Aristotelian. Aristotle said that the best way to learn the moral life, find the good man, watch him, and then imitate him. <laughs> See, so there's habituation grounded in the watching of a great master. Now see the comparison to apprenticeship. Someone learns to paint, not say, by just reading the rule book of painting, but by watching a great painter, moving in, uh, sharing the life of the great painter, as, as the apprentices in the Renaissance did. Um, watching him in action and then imitating him. So the Pope, following John Paul here very much, says, the saints, the saints are the masters in the moral and the spiritual life. We watch them, we imitate them, we become habituated. Now, here's a little, I'll call it Franciscan uh, twist. Yes, the saints, these great moral exemplars. But Francis says, it's typical of him, uh, sometimes it's even those who are a bit, you know, compromised. Maybe they're not pure saints, but I can still learn something from the way that maybe in a, in a halting way, they've embodied the life of virtue. What came right to my mind was Graham Greene's famous whiskey priest, you know, from The Power and the Glory, that wonderful novel, where the hero, he really is a hero, but he's, he's not a, a pure saint. I mean, he's not a flawless figure. He's deeply compromised. But yet, he does exemplify something in the moral life of great power. 
Or think of you know, one of my favorite novels, uh, Brideshead Revisited. Sebastian, who's a deeply compromised figure, you know, morally, spiritually, otherwise. But he emerges by the end of that novel as indeed an exemplary figure. That struck me as very uh, Franciscan as he lays out this, uh, this image. Okay, the second thing I found in chapter 7 that was really interesting was reflections on our present-day communication technology. Now, Pope Francis, what, he's 82 years old, uh, is not someone that really uses this technology a lot, but he is sensitive to its prevalence today, certainly, and, and some of the dangers associated with it. Here's the first observation he makes that I think is, is interesting. He said, we have to, in the face of communication technology, cultivate especially the virtue of hope. And when I first read that, I thought, what in the world, what does he mean by that? Well, he said, communication technology, think of all the stuff we have, encourages immediate gratification, immediate information, immediate entertainment. You know, uh, I, I want to know something, oh, just Google it, you'll find out. I, I want entertainment, oh, press a button, there it is. I, I want stimulus of some kind, oh, there it is, just press a button. When in fact, he says, quite correctly, it seems to me, that the greatest things in life, right, the best things in life, intellectually, morally, spiritually, are things that don't come that way. They don't come by way of instant gratification. They come through a long, steady process. Think of reading a great author, a great novelist, or a great philosopher. Think of growing in virtue. Think of appreciating a great work of art. Right? That doesn't happen like that. It happens through patience and therefore through something like hope. So I thought that was a very wise bit of advice he gives to, uh, to young people. Cultivate the virtue of hope. The second thing he says, and this is more commonly shared, I'd say, among uh, commentators, is the virtue of socialization. Uh, the master image here for the Pope, he said, is the family all sitting around the dining room table, but they're all on their individual mobile devices. You know? So they're not relating, they're not socializing, not speaking to each other, they're all in their inner world. That's an image in his mind of what's wrong with a lot of our setup today. And, and I couldn't help but think here of, of Jean Twenge, whom I've commented upon, her book iGen, right, about the rising generation, so shaped by this technology, that that's what she sees. A, a generation now increasingly incapable of engaging in, in socialization. Much more content to stay in that inner world. Uh, a little uh, incapable of reading social cues, etc. All those observations she makes, I think, are reiterated by, uh, by Pope Francis here. Um, the third thing I notice, the third major category in this chapter 7 of Amor Thetitia, has to do with um, education in the area of sexuality. Uh, the Pope is, is very aware of the prevalence of pornography, very aware of, of how sexual images and, and uh, and a certain ideology around sex, that it's a matter simply of freedom, you know, that I should do whatever I want to do in that area. How prevalent, how dangerously prevalent all of that is. Here's his basic point, and it's very John Paul II. Sexuality, like everything else, has got to be brought under the aegis of love, which means self-gift. So it's not primarily, despite the culture here, it's not primarily a question of, of free self-expression. I should be able to do and say what, what I want sexually. No, no. It's sexuality as a vehicle of, of love, of other orientation. Um, sex is, is beautiful, the body is wonderful, but they should be brought under the discipline and aegis of the virtue of love. And so where does this happen? He's dead right about this. It happens primarily in the family. If the family isn't giving this kind of instruction and virtue, what will happen? The culture will hijack young minds and hearts. Is that happening? Well, it answers itself, that question. So families have got to be in the front lines of shaping people in the virtue of love and sex as a self-gift. I like this language, again, reminiscent of John Paul II, of learning the language of the body. Now, it means partially physiology and biology and all that, but, but more, more broadly here, the language of the body means our capacity through the body to express love. And to learn that language in all of its complexity and density is a, is a first responsibility of the family. Really important stuff. Um, here's just a last reflection. I'll close with this. Um, uh, Christian Smith, who's the great sociologist of, of religion at Notre Dame, has done all these um, studies. 
of young people and why they stay, why they leave the faith. And uh, he says this, the number one indicator that, that a young person will stay within uh, the faith is that the faith is vibrantly practiced within the family. It's very important now. I know it sounds simple, but the, the, the danger is either there's, there's no faith lived at all or that it's simply outsourced. So send the kids to this school or send them to this program. That's not enough. It's the faith vibrantly lived, witnessed to, talked about, modeled within the family is the clearest indicator that a young person is going to stay um, in the faith. Well, as he closes this chapter, Pope Francis makes exactly that same observation about the passing on of the faith being a function of the family. So look, formation and virtue, absolutely, it happens first in the family through the, the exemplarity of the parents, etc. Uh, training in regard to this new technology. Where's that going to happen but in the family where you learn socialization? Sex education, where's it going to happen? Primarily in the family. The vibrantly lived faith and witness there is what conduces most to um, a young person staying in the faith. So I might recommend as I close, uh, crack open Amoris Laetitia again. Maybe you read at it when it first came out. Maybe you were just caught up in all the debates about a section of chapter 8, maybe reread the thing, and I might recommend begin with chapter 7. 